Why don't y'all stand to your feet as we begin our praise and worship this morning?
me to your heart. It makes my spirit sing. It makes my spirit sing. Your grace, your grace. I hear it call my name. I'm waking up to sing. I'm waking up to sing. To your heart, it makes my spirit sing. It makes my spirit sing. Your grace, your grace, I hear it call my name. I'm waking up to sing. Oh, I'm waking up to sing. We will sing and shout, sing and shout. Open up. pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for your great love for us. We thank you, Father, that um, you today. We're thankful, Father, for just each and every family, every home represented here today, Lord. You're good to us. We thank you. Lord, I, uh, I just pray that in the course of our time here today that we will just be struck by the awesome privilege that is ours, the privilege to worship. Help us, God, to worship you in all honesty, or as you say, in spirit and in truth. Lord, I just pray that you would be our teacher today through your word. I pray that the fellowship, the worship, the singing, uh, the word proclamation, everything would bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. I don't think I'm on, am I? Am I I on? Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. 
Yeah, I just wanted to see if y'all were paying attention. Good. Hey, uh, I can't wait till Amber gets over here and tells you a little bit about because it's embarrassing for me. Y'all can assume by now that this was the last bodybuilding contest I was in. And, uh, uh, I, but I'll let Amber tell a little bit more about that in a minute. But we've had a blessed, blessed weekend. It's been a great weekend in the life of Tiga K Baptist Church, and you'll hear more about that now with some announcements. All right. Well, good morning, Tiga K Baptist. It's so great to see you here this morning, and a special welcome to our live streaming viewers as well. If you are visiting with us, if you wouldn't mind filling out the visitor information card that's found in your bulletin, it just tears off on the side and placing it in one of the offering plates as you leave today or giving it to Pastor Tim, we would love to connect with you about more information about our church this week. So what's happening this week? Tonight, the students, that sixth grade and up, they ha are having a tie-dye party in Building 3 from 5 to 7.30. And they're asking that you bring one to two pieces of white clothing to tie-dye during their party. And they're going to have Oreos afterwards. So, so, woo! Sign up. I'm using the Sign Up Genius link that's found on the social media or the weekly email. And then Wednesday nights, we have classes for all ages. Pastor Tim is doing week three of three of the Three Circle series about how to share your faith conversationally. And that will be in here in the sanctuary for students sixth grade all the way up through adults. So that's 6.30 to 7.30 in here. Um, prayer meets in the choir room. And if you are not on the prayer chain, we have just seen so many answers to prayer over the last couple of weeks. So join them Wednesday nights in praying in the choir room, 6.30 to 7.30. Randy Waycaster is teaching a Financial Peace University. They're only on week two, so it's not too late to jump into that. Um, see him if you want to sign up. And many of you have expressed interest of doing that class a night other than Wednesday nights. So we are working on getting that on the schedule as well. And then kids ages four through fifth grade are with me in building two from 6.30 to 7.30 as well. And then next Sunday, uh, we have Randy Ellis leading the class about the Old Testament in the East Wing from 9.30 to 10.30, so join him for that. And then Annie Armstrong, it is our last week to collect donations for Annie Armstrong. And last week, um, I, I mentioned our goal is $2,500. We are now at $2,085, so we are so close to meeting our goal. So donate to that if you um, feel led to do that. Do that this week. All right, kiddos, well, come on up here, my Bible quiz team. Pick up your loot as you get up here on stage. Let's gather closely so that the folks on live stream can see you. I am so proud of these kids. We competed yesterday. Gather here, kind of you get in front of me. Good. Everybody get in there in the, in the shot? Good. Okay. So... Ten of our kids traveled to um, Atlanta this weekend, and we are part of the South Car the state of South Carolina region for Bible quizzing, and we were competing with kids from four other states this weekend, and they were tested on the entire book of Exodus. We have been working on this since August, and they did amazing. I'm telling you, Pastor Tim and I talked... They did better than we would have done. These questions were hard. It took analytical thinking. It took taking what they learned and applying it to questions. This, this test was no joke. So I want to call out um, a couple of, we got some team awards and some individual awards. So we got the sixth place team. So if you were part of that team, hold up your, your team award. Sixth place team, let's give them a round of applause. We also took the third place spot. We have the third place team. Hold up your trophies for that. Very good. And then we had several that placed um, individually as well. We had Dylan placed 10th. So Dylan, hold up your award. Good. We had Renee placed 9th. Renee, hold up. Good. Uh, Lily placed 8th. Marley placed fourth. Lydia, this was her first time competing. She got third place. And Micah took second place of the whole competition. And he only missed tying for first place by one question. The competition was that stiff. So big round of applause to all of them. And then we had um, Micah, Renee, and Lily competed Friday evening in a Bible memorization contest. 
they had 15 minutes to say as many verses as they possibly could in 15 minutes. And um, Micah perfectly couldn't miss a word, word for word, or a letter. It was so specific. Um, Micah and Lily did 16 verses in 15 minutes, and Renee did 18 verses in 15 minutes. So more importantly, and yes, I'm competitive, and I love that they all won trophies and awards, but more importantly, these kids and these parents supported these kids in studying through an entire book of the Bible. And that, they're storing God's word in their heart, and just that is the most important thing that I think we want to praise them for this morning. So one last round of applause. <laughs> all right, guys, you can set your trophies here and go back to your seats. And if you are new and wondering, how do I get my kids involved in this? Um, they, this team was third through sixth grade, and we practice on Wednesday evenings. And it starts in August and runs the length of the school year. And next year, they'll be doing the books. They'll be doing three books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. And if we get enough volunteers, we could actually have a team of first and second graders as well. So that brings me to my next point. Um, we are, as you can see, our, our children's numbers are growing, and that's just an answer to prayer. But with that comes the need for more volunteers. So if you have served with us in the past and would like to serve again, maybe you took a break during COVID but would like to serve with us again, please let me know. And if you are not serving but you are willing to serve in some way, please let me know. We have some current needs that we have. We have two families expecting new babies in the next couple of months. So we have a need to reopen our nursery. We have a need on Wednesday nights to break out. We have a um, preschool through second grade class that's combined. We, it's gotten so big we need to break that into two separate classes. So we need volunteers for that. And that will just continue through June and then you get a break for the summer. So if you can help us on Wednesday nights, and then uh, we need one more CWX team on Sunday mornings. And oh, we have had many people ask about, they want to attend Randy Ellis' class, 9.30 to 10.30, but we don't have childcare for that. So we also need some volunteers for Sunday morning. If you could help uh, with the kids so that the parents can go to Randy Ellis' class, we need help for that. Um, you can serve weekly, bi-weekly, maybe monthly. There's low prep options. And then if you're a teacher, there is a lot of prep involved in that. And we do ask that you be a member for that. So, Tim. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the, the volunteers. There are several things that hold people back. One, you think, well, I'm not qualified. We can coach you up. Second, well, I just don't have time. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> Maybe then you're just way too busy. Uh, there you, you can find time to help out because we're investing in the lives of children and adults. Uh, it for, it's an eternal investment. I mean, you can't get better than that. And I'll, I'll say now, you know, if you're a guest here today, you probably don't know this, but we've got plans, uh, which the whole church will be in on soon, uh, we hope sooner than later. We've hit a few bumps in the road, but uh, the church will be seeing concrete plans of the new facility that we're hoping to break ground for in just a few months, just up the road, past 160 uh, uh, intersection. And um, we're only going to progress, and we're only going to grow in direct correlation to how much you're willing to serve, how much you're willing to give. Give of your time, give of your resources, give of your, I mean, give of yourself. Uh, great churches and eh churches, the only thing that separates them is the amount of commitment of those who are in the church. And uh, so we really need you to step up to the plate in, in some of this. If I declare, if, if I could get out of uh, preaching once a month or something, I'd sign up and do CWX, <laughs> I believe. But uh, So maybe if you want to preach and we can maybe test you out a little bit first, uh, let me know. And I'll go do CWX sometime too. But uh, anyway, let me say one other thing too. Um, um, the biggest joke around this church is the fact that Amber's part-time. 
<laughs> there is no such thing. And uh, I just want to say in front of the church, not only thank you, Amber, but I think the church owes her a great deal of thanks. This weekend and everything that led, it wasn't just this weekend, but everything that's led up to this weekend, there's a lot of our people that help out in this in so many ways. And if I start naming individuals, uh, you can do it if you want to, I'll forget. But, but Amber's put a great program together so that even other churches that are three, four, five times our size are saying, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing with your kids? We love what you're doing in your children's uh, ministry. And so um, I just, I, I think we, we just need to say a huge thank you for that, for this weekend. When I saw where she had arranged for them to stay this weekend, uh, some of the team and all that kind of stuff, I'm like, oh my goodness. And then I saw the price of it, and it wasn't an oh my goodness. It was a wow, that's reasonable, you know, so she's cheap. <laughs> too and uh, <laughs> but uh, but it was really awesome and she just put a lot of work in this and uh, I, I sometimes don't think Tiga K knows what we got so y'all just give her a thanks thank you thank you, thank you. and I did forget to mention my amazing volunteers my partner Miss Teddy who who taught me about Bible quizzing and got my kids involved in Bible quizzing years ago so without her Melissa Catherine Denise all just help me tremendously so thank you if you do think you want to sign up to volunteer and help me in some way I'm teaching CWX today meet me over here by the exit sign afterwards and I'd love to get you um, connected with how you can how you can help us thank you well stand to your feet we'll continue to worship him in praise before you stand to your feet let me let me let me just we got all the time in the world my sermon's only an hour and a half today uh, uh, Exodus 5 verse 3 says that Moses pleaded with Pharaoh to give the Israelites a three-day spiritual retreat. It was like a time off. And said, if he didn't, he feared God would lead the Israelites in a revolt. That's a possible answer. Two, send plagues on the Israelites themselves. Three, Send plagues on the Egyptians are for none of the above. How many say it's, now you got to commit. How many say it's one would lead the Israelites in a revolt? How many say that he would send plagues to the Israelites? How many say he would send plagues on the Egyptians? How many say none of the above? The first meeting of Moses with Pharaoh to ask for a three-day spiritual retreat, according to Exodus 5, verse 3, was that he would send plagues on the Israelites, Israelites. themselves first. And that we was had the kids get thing. that right. That's we, we one of the it. kids' questions. A lot of y'all said, oh, I, we used to do that when I was little, where you look up the Bible verse. Well, duh, that's just how fast your fingers can turn the pages. But this is, this is actual from memory. memory Stuff, and I'm sitting there going, no, 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 no. It didn't say that. <laughs> and Kim looked it up, and, and then Amber sends a note oh to God. Kim by they text, and they're this. saying, they you they need to check <laughs> that, because we don't think that's right. And we looked at Exodus 5, verse 3, that they, he was afraid if they didn't go on a spiritual retreat that God would send plagues on the Israelites, Israelites themselves. Yeah. And I'm like, well, they wrote that in there overnight. I've never <laughs> seen that before. So... And the sword. Right, right, right. So, I mean, yeah. It's tough. Your, your, it's your kids tough. didn't just get up there and, you know, I mean, there's value to attention. Draw your swords. Find Genesis 42.1. There's value to that because a lot of y'all, if I said turn to Hezekiah chapter 2, you'd break your necks trying to find it. <laughs> and it ain't in there. So there's value to know in the books of the Bible and how to find stuff and all that. But these kids learned hard stuff. Yep. So spread the word. Get your kids, grandkids, neighbors' kids involved. But we need you to be involved as a volunteer, too. I'm done. I'm now done. let's stand let's and let's worship him. together.
together. There was, there was between us, by the cross you came and broke them down, you broke them down. And there were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name. see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You know, I think of that verse, you have not seen him, you love him. You know, you do not see him now, you believe in him. that we're in, that we don't see him, but we feel the Holy Spirit in the room. We feel the Holy Spirit in the room, and that's indescribable. It's amazing. of heights to 
the depths of the sea. Creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. He is all powerful, untamable. Bless pastor as you speak through it. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Amen. All right, children, you got your worship time.
They're scary. I'm telling you. <laughs> they know stuff I couldn't even pronounce now, much less uh, know about it. Well, we're continuing in our series today on the Christian lifestyle. And um, we're kind of taking it from a, a backdoor entrance. We are looking at what a Christian is supposed to be. Not always what a Christian is or focuses on, but what a Christian ought to be. What should define, what should characterize a Christian lifestyle as opposed to another kind of lifestyle? Well, over the past two weeks, we have focused on a couple of different topics. We focused on absolute truth. In other words, on, on standing on the Word of God, and uh, we focused on love, loving others with God's definition of love, and today we're focusing on telling. You say, oh boy, here we go, another message on telling. Well, I hope that every time we talk about this, maybe something new is gained. And I hope that maybe every time we talk about this, we'll see just how important it is to God through all the scripture that we look at related to this topic. And it ought to be a huge subject for us. Um, and by the way, those of you who haven't been here yet, we've had pretty decent response on Wednesday nights. If you haven't been here yet on Wednesday night um, for the three circles, yes, this is the third week of three. But I'll say two things about that. Number one, we will do this at another time for those who have not yet done it. Second, it's still not too late to come because every night we go back and start from scratch and we go over what each circle means and how we share our faith conversationally. We go back to the beginning of it and walk through it slowly with each other every Wednesday night. And so we're going to do that again this week. And I hope you'll be here for that because that directly relates to uh, what I'm talking about today. One of the biggest hesitations uh, that we have is that we feel like we don't know what to say. And so we, we want to give you some things you can say and talk about, but the passion, well, if the passion's not there, that's another subject for another time, but we'll talk about that later. But this is a natural progression moving from absolute truth, uh, the absolute standard of measurement for all that we are and all that we do based on the Word of God, and uh, moving from that to love, and now progressing uh, to telling others about it. That's the natural way it is with us about anything. If I believe on an easy subject, if, if I believe that um, the lasagna at Maggiano's in South Park is the best store-bought lasagna you can get, the best restaurant-bought lasagna you can get. And I really love it, abusing the word love again, but I really love that lasagna. Just in the natural way of things, I can't keep my mouth shut. I'm a raver. I'm one that I do not understand. I don't understand. It doesn't compute with me when somebody really, really likes something that they don't want to just tell everybody about it. I don't get that because if I know that that lasagna, if I believe that lasagna, it's true, that it's really good, and I really love that lasagna, and I love that experience there and everything, then I'm going to say, hey, you, have you been to Maggiano's yet? Maggiano's is a pretty good place. I mean, it's not top of the line but it's sure not bottom of the line. It's, it's a, just a good middle-of-the-road restaurant. But have you tried the lasagna? Oh, my goodness. You ought to, I mean, it's amazing. And, then, and I'm going to go on and on and on about it. Why? Well, it's just normal. It's almost more abnormal if you don't talk about something that you really like. And most of the time, the things that we talk about in the presence of others is just pure conversation are the things that we like. Tell me, come September, some of you fanatics won't be getting on to me about Clemson. 
especially after Georgia trounces them, you know. Tell me I won't hear from some of y'all. Don't look at me that way, Tim. Uh, Tim Bradbury's giving me an evil eye, and I can just barely see over his mask. Um, well, Georgia does not have one returning starter in the defensive backfield, and the offensive line is suspect too, so I'm not real hopeful. But I live in faith. Anyway, uh, <laughs> But we tell people stuff that we like and that we believe in. And I know for a fact, because I've been here long enough, in the year and a half that I've been here, to know that there are people here in Tiga K, and specifically in this community of believers, Tiga K Baptist Church, that have a passion to reach this community. Not just say it, not just put it on a sign out front or on a, a business card to hand out, but I know for a fact there are people that are saying, all right, we're tired of talking about it. We want to reach out in this community. There are some that want to go past here and reach out into the world. And, but there are some here that have a passion and a real strong desire to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ and to reach this community and around the world with that. But that passion needs to be more contagious. It needs to be more serious because it's a vital part of the future of this church. Every church that is established of every denomination stands in danger of becoming a lackluster religious organization if the passion of the good news of Jesus Christ is not taught his word is not taught. He is not celebrated on a regular basis. And if we don't see lives changing, we stand in danger of just being yet another religious organization that has meetings and committees and more meetings, more committees, and it just kind of goes on. But you see, if we really don't have a passion for people without Jesus Christ, a passion to tell others about Jesus Christ, then we really don't have much of a reason to keep gathering here at church. What's it for? Our head knowledge? Is it to make us feel better about ourselves? And by the way, that passion at some point in time has got to get outside the four walls of this church or we have truly failed. And again, like I said a minute ago, if there's no passion, well, there's a problem. And that's another sermon for another day. Well, sure, you say, well, we could get together and we could sing great songs and it'd be encouraging, and it would be. We could get together and learn about the Bible. You'd be a lot smarter, certainly if you hung out with our kids. Sure, we could get together and have great fellowship, and I love hanging out with uh, most of you anyway. And... <laughs> And there, 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 there are uh, all, these are all very important things that the Bible is clear, but the Bible's clear that we are charged with the responsibility, and I use that word carefully, with the responsibility of telling others about Jesus Christ. We are called to give the gospel in telling others. You say, well, where do you start? Well, a good place to start is who is Jesus to you? What's, what's he done in your life? You see, all of this is our responsibility. And this is the task that we all must take very, very seriously. And that's what today's message is all about. So how do we tell others about Jesus? Why do we tell others about Jesus? How do we actually reach others for Jesus? How do we focus on making this a priority? Well, there's no better place to go to than the Word of God. I know that's... Uh, novel idea for a lot of churches these days but that's where we're going and you're going to get ready if you have an app on your phone or if you have your your literal bible in your hand get ready because we're getting ready to hit a lot of scriptures so first one luke 14 16 through 23 you know the story i think most of you it says jesus replied with this story a man prepared a great feast sent out many invitations when the banquet was ready he sent his servant to tell the guest, come, the banquet's ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. 
Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I now have a wife, so I can't come. I'm not going to comment on that. The, the servant returned and told his master what they had said. And his master was furious and said, and go into the streets. Go into the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, let me just stop right here and say, why do you think he focused on these people? They're not more precious in God's eyes than the educated, the wealthy, the strong, the successful. They're not more important. Have you ever read that and thought, well, why didn't he say, go down to the Rotary Club on the corner or go down to the Garden Club down the street or... Go down to the, the tennis association. They're having a big meeting there and invite all those people to come in. You see, one of the success, wealth, education, it can be a blessing. And it can help you be a blessing to others. But one of the potential curses of success and wealth, it's not an automatic but one of the potential curses of it is it can make you believe you're self-sufficient. It can make you believe you don't need anything else or anybody else. We've seen this all throughout Scripture. and We've seen it through history. Maybe you've even seen it in your own history. We've talked about this before, but the pattern goes, it's just, it's ridiculous. It just repeats itself again and again and again in Scripture. You got the children of Israel. God's blessed them. He frees them from the hands of the Egyptians. They go through the desert. Less than two weeks into their march in the desert, they're going, Josh, I wish we'd stayed in Egypt. We're eating the same thing every day. We're eating manna, 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 manna all the time. And uh, at least in Egypt, we could go fishing in the Nile. We could eat leeks, pull leeks up by the, uh, uh, by the Nile. We, we had some meat once in a while. We want some meat. Uh, and, and they just they start griping and complaining, and, and God provides for them. And just a short time later, they start griping and complaining again. Then they, they have to wait in the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience. And then they get into the promised land, promised land. And they get in there, and it's gorgeous. It's amazing. God's provided all this for them. He's fought their battles for them. And what do they do? A very short time later, they start forgetting God, doing their own thing, worshiping different gods, and God allows them to be taken over by a foreign oppressor. So when the foreign oppressor comes in and takes them over, all of a sudden they're, God's got their attention again. And they're like, oh, help us. They've made us slaves. They've taken us over. Help us, help us, help us. And so God delivers them eventually. They enjoy the fat of the land again. They become successful again. And what happens? They forget God all over again. I've used this example before, but I want to use it again. On 9-11, I was pastor in the Orlando, Florida area. And when that happened, we opened up the church that afternoon for prayer, and it was full. People we'd never met before or since came. That Sunday, the church, we had to put extra chairs out in the back. The church had never had that many people there. It was busting at the seams. Fast forward about three or four weeks, and we had the same old crowd with some of the same old gripes. Well, I'm not sure that I think they're cleaning the children's area as well as they should. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure the air conditioner is working properly here. I, I don't want to come on Tuesday nights for a men's meeting. Why can't we do it on Thursday nights? That's my best night. And these things become, the minor things became the major things, and the church lost focus again, and the population of the church began to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle until another crisis would come, and we had one of our deacons, our chairman of deacons, killed. Uh, by a drunk driver, once again, the church was full. People were turning to God again. 
looking for answers. I'm just asking, what's it going to take in our life to get our attention? Because, you see, God has prepared this banquet he's talking about for us. Call it, and it's not just pie in the sky by and by. Eternal life begins the moment that we surrender our wills to the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him and accept his free gift of grace. That's when eternal life begins. Not when we die in this physical body and go to heaven. It started already for those of us who are walking with Christ. We will never die a total death. Our bodies will, but we won't. And God's provided this banquet for us. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to go out and tell other people, I got this cool banquet. I got all this great stuff. Will you you just go out and tell people that? If, If we had free stacks of $10,000, and we said, look, we got a free stack of $10,000, but it's one per family. Go tell everybody you you know they can come in here and get a free stack of $10,000. There is not one person in this room that wouldn't immediately call your son, call your daughter, call your cousins, call your uncle, call your mom, call your dad, call your work associates, go to their house. Hey, come to our church real quick. You get a free stack of $10,000 if you just come, but she's only one per family, but you got to come. We got 24 hours to get it. Will you come? And God says, I've prepared it all for you, this banquet, his love, his forgiveness salvation, eternity, will you come? I don't know if I can make it. Do you think you'd hear that if it was $10,000? I'm too busy. Do you think you'd hear that if it was $10,000? You see, here's my point. When we read scriptures like this, and I'm just going to be direct, I, I, I'm, I don't know another way to be. Shut up, Randy. Uh, (laughs) I'm not sure we really believe God. Oh, on some level we do. But I'm not sure we really believe the promises of God. Because if we really believe the promises of God, it's too good to fathom. And yet it's there. And he's saying, all I want you to do is go tell people the banquet's already ready. They don't have to cook. They don't have to clean. They don't just come to the banquet. Mm. But you see, those with needs. They had a, an ear to hear and a heart to follow because they had needs. If we don't understand that we've got needs in life, then we'll never appreciate the solutions. And so after the servant had gone out to the highways and hedges and compelled them to come in, he said, "Uh, there's still room for more. So his master said, okay, this time I want you to go into the country lanes behind the hedges. Urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full so that my house will be full and that's where we are as a church now hold on I'm not talking about just getting people here so the place will be full but listen we could have a great big club here of people who enjoy just getting together a few times a week but that's not what God wants for his church he wants us to be passionate about going out and bringing in the people who know, who are ready to hear, you have a need, God has an answer. Maybe it's people with literal physical needs. Maybe it's people with literal financial needs. Everybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ has a spiritual need. It's just sometimes harder to convince those people that they do have a need if they can still have tons of money in the bank and a good education, a good job, and a pretty family. It's just harder. So that's why he says, compel 
them to come in. Today, we focus on how to do that, how to tell them, how to bring them in so that his house may be filled. There's four things I want to share with you today. First of all, number one, why do we tell? 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This ought to be enough. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So Jesus wants us to tell so that people can be saved. For some reason, I don't know why, I don't even know if it's the best stewardship of it, but he's God and I'm not, and all God's people said, amen to that. And for some reason, God chose us to be his instruments to reach the lost and dying world. A world that without God really is desperate. A world that exists in darkness and we're to be the ones to bring the light into the darkness. The light that can change everything. The light of Jesus Christ. Luke eleven thirty three says, No one lights a lamp and then hides it or puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. So why? Because Jesus tells us to. Look at Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world. And preach the good news to all creation. And you say, ah, there you go. I'm not called to be a preacher. <laughs> I, when, did we, when did sharing the good news of Jesus Christ become just a vocation? You, you know, I, I, I have said to Kim a hundred times, if, if I, I wish one of my biggest regrets in life, and as you get older, you have regrets, but here's one of my biggest regrets in life. I'm just the opposite of mechanically minded. <laughs> I can't understand anything mechanical. Math, that's teachers playing a joke on you. That ain't even real. Uh, and, and, and so mechanical stuff, mathematics, all this kind of stuff, building things. Fixing things, uh, you know. I'll, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know what I'd do, but I wish. I really wish, young people, hear me. I wish I'd learned to trade. I really do, and I and I wish that we still had the old apprentice system that really a lot of countries still do. Germany still has that, and it works really well. You apprentice with people or with a company and you're paid to do an internship or an apprenticeship with them and you learn that trade or you learn that skill or, or, or you learn anything from banking to car sales or whatever you learn these things and that's good I wish I had a trade you say oh because you don't want to preach no no I would still preach but I'd do it for free I'd do it for the fun of it I would do it for free, and let's let the money of the church just go elsewhere into other stuff and everything. But you see, because we have vocational ministers, we think that those are the people that we're hiring to do the Christian compelling and teaching and preaching for us. When in actuality, it's, close your ears, Joe, you hate this word, I know. It's the volunteers in a church. It's all of us. Not just the, quote, vocational Christians. So why do we tell? Because bottom line, it pleases God. And it's what he's commanded us to do. Number two, what do we tell? Well, that's a lot of what we're learning about on Wednesday nights. Please come Wednesday night if you're not familiar with that. Salvation is, Romans 3.23, it begins this way. Everyone is sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. That's the bottom line. And then Romans 6, 23 says the wages of that sin, what you're paid for the work of that sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You've heard this before, but just in summary, God is holy. He must punish sin. There's no question about that or he wouldn't be a good and perfect father. 
God can never allow sin to slip past him unnoticed. God has to punish sin, and he will. So now, if we were to stop right there, we'd have no hope. And the whole world would be hopelessly lost. Because the Bible's just told us that no one is perfect, no one is holy like God. And we talked about in the Bible study before the worship time this morning, we talked about in there, there's only two ways to be saved. There's only two ways to come to God. One is live a perfect life. Well, the Bible's just told us we can't live a perfect, perfect life because all of us have sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of that sin is death. So the only other way left open to come to God is where Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You can come to the Father through me. You're, I'm the only way you're going to come to the Father is through me. So because we've fallen short, because we don't measure up to God's holiness, we all have sin in our hearts, there will be punishment for that sin. And there is, listen to what I'm about to say, there is nothing we can humanly do about it. So, end of story, we're hopelessly lost. But the reason that I pause here is this. The gift of God's grace, the gift of God's forgiveness is not really viewed so much as a, you know, it's almost like getting socks at Christmas if we don't understand what that means in our lives. Socks is like, okay, good. I got some holes in my socks. I'm glad to get another pair of socks. I'm thankful. I'm appreciative. Don't get real excited about it. I don't open the socks and go, oh, man, just what I've always wanted, socks. <clears throat> And we talk about this gift of God's grace and God's forgiveness, but it really doesn't sink into us until we realize just how much we really need it because we're lost without him. Again, without him, there is no hope. There is no peace. There is no comfort. There is no joy. There is no salvation. And in order to be saved, you have to come to the realization that you're, first, that you're lost first. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. In other words, we cannot earn our salvation. It is a gift from God. You ever heard somebody say, well, I just hope I've done enough good to make it over to the, through the pearly gates when I die? If that's your view, you probably won't. Because I'm telling you, we can't do enough good to make it to God. We need to come his way. You know, if, if, if this place started, heaven forbid, this place started to burn, and I mean it was a flash fire, gas line busted or something and, and fire was blazing through here and I said listen listen the fire's over there the fire's back there the fire's down there the only way out is right through this door right here so everybody go to this door right here and you stand there and go yeah. I mean yeah, okay that's a good way but I like going out this door or, or I, 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 I want to go out this. You're going to stand there and argue with me when the place is in flames? And you're going to tell me that that's not? Salvation is from God. And Jesus says he is the only way to God. You want to argue with him about that? That's your thing. But let me tell you, it's a matter of life or death. Titus 3, verse 5, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, verse 8, love this verse. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to profess my faith in Christ and 
follow him in believers' baptism and unite with a local church body when I get my act together. Yeah. I, I'm going to do all that as soon as I, there's just a few things I need to take care of in my life first. Right. That's about like saying I'm going to wait to get married when I can afford it. <laughs> There's maybe a few of you that have reached that, but most of us, you know, Kim and I were sweating two weeks before our marriage. I had no job, and I was whew, like this. And exactly two weeks before our wedding date, finally got called to a job. It was in the armpit of the United States of America, but it was a job anyway. But anyway, Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might have a chance at salvation. All right, look at the sequence here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, where is that mouth confession coming from? You have believed in your heart. Because what's in your heart is what's going to proceed out your mouth. It doesn't go, it's not just a matter of, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the demons believe. James says that the demons believe and tremble. So it's not just a matter of a mental assent to the fact that there is a God. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. That moves you. That moves you to action. You will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. So what's the summary of the salvation? Understand that we're all sinners. Two, know that Jesus is indeed God. Three, believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sins. Four, believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead, proving that he can conquer both physical and spiritual death. And five, you place your trust in his promise to save you. Now, real quickly, how do we tell? Well, first of all, with knowledge. Say, so, ah, I knew it. There's something I got to memorize. No, I'm not talking about that. But listen to what first, it's, we read in 1 Peter 3.15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to explain it. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody says, all right, explain to me the Trinity. <laughs> And then you, for the next five minutes, explain very succinctly what it means to believe in the Trinity. No, it's not talking about that. But you've got to know who Jesus is. You've got to know the exclusivity of Jesus, that it's Jesus or nothing. You've got to know that he's God's son. You've got to know that there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Th those are basic things that we've got to know. And we must know some of those basics, like, you know, and so how do we tell? B, with love. 1 Peter 3, 16, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Let me, note, let me point out here what it does not say. It doesn't say you compromise the word of God. It, it, th this morning, we, we listened to, what do you think? Another Vody Balkum sermon. I posted it on my Facebook, by the way. If you will take the time to watch this sermon, you will be greatly blessed today. And it's on the difference between biblical justice and social justice. And it's got some of the Christian pop stars of today. Sorry, y'all, I'm about to bust your bubble on some of these. But they asked, they interview Lauren Daigle and Lecrae, something very specific about well, what do you believe about this? I'm talking about issues the Bible is black and white clear on. And both of them say, well, you know, I'm still learning. I don't know. I, I just hope God's okay with this. I just, you know, I'm not going to judge. I'm not. 
we're always gentle. We're always to be respectful. We're not to be obnoxious, abusive evangelism dumpers. I had a guy on the University of Georgia campus that used to preach all the time. And my daughter would walk by and, and uh, I don't know what he judged her on. Maybe because she's got a piercing in her nose and a tattoo on her neck or Maybe she just looked cross-eyed one day or something. I don't know what it was. But he used to just yell out, you're going to hell. Now, boy, that's a great way to start a conversation with somebody, isn't it? You're going to hell. Now let me tell you about the love of Jesus. <laughs> it, but it says we got to be willing to give reason for the hope we have. We do it in a gentle and respectful way, but we do not compromise what the Bible says. That is not judging. That is simply pronouncing what God has already judged. We do it with three, understanding. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. That's a strong verse. We do it with prayer. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. And with your testimony fit. Matthew 5.16 says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine so that you might get a ticket to heaven. I just want to see if y'all are awake. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father so that he'll be honored, so that he'll get the credit. And then where do we tell? Finally, well, that that we just read in Luke 14, 23, so his master says, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges, urge anyone you find to come in so that my house may be full. That's it. Wherever we're going out to, the world, local, state, national, international, it means sometimes maybe giving up some vacation time to go on short-term trips to let people know about Jesus. That's not that huge of a sacrifice. That is a world-A problem. It's going to mean sending and supporting full-time missionaries, parents. You make a big deal about your kids being trained in academics and sports and their hobbies. Why not encourage your kids to give six months or a year of their lives to being trained in missions? My suggestion would be, of course, you haven't asked me, but that's the great thing about being the preacher right now. I get to say this, and you just have to sit there and go. <laughs> but I, I think a worthy goal is for every Christian parent, either, either the year after high school or the year after college, let your kid learn about missions somewhere else on this earth other than right here in the U.S., it expands their worldview. It shows that it sometimes teaches them a different language. It gives them perspective of life. And it shows that not everybody in this world is as either complacent as we are in the U.S. about the gospel or maybe that it's even harder in some places than it is here. But it will change their lives. I wish my girls were here now to give testimony of the times that they spent in places. Even our, at the time, she's a tough woman now with four kids, oldest is six, but Lauren was a little more of a diva then. We thought she was going to be our diva child. And Lauren and McKenna spent some time living on the third floor of the Atlanta Rescue Mission in downtown Atlanta, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for homeless people and playing with the children of the drug addicts and homeless of downtown Atlanta. Life change. Life change. The time that McKenna was at Word of Life Bible College in uh, Argentina, 
or Word of Life Bible College in Mafra, Portugal, or going through training in Washington, D.C., in Orlando, Florida, uh, just all these trainings and things that have helped shape their perspective in life and give them focus in life. Why would we not want our children to even get in on the ground floor of that? It's going to mean helping those in our midst. It means the pregnancy centers. It's not such a big deal here in Tiga K that we have an open food pantry or something like that. There's not that much need for that here. I'm not saying there's no need for that. There's not that much need for that here. But I want to tell you something. Rich people, poor people, they all get pregnant when they do things outside of God's plan. And we need to be actively involved in pregnancy centers, in prison ministries, in hospitals, in the schools, in friends and family, inviting and investing people in and taking people to coffee and taking people to dinner and bringing people, not just inviting them, but bringing them to church. It means serving. It means being a willing missionary in whatever way you can in the workplace, right here in our church facility. It may mean going door to door, distributing door hangers or doing surveys in town. Whatever it takes, whatever that is, that command has still not passed us by just because we're in 2021 that we are to go into the highways and hedges and compel anyone to come in that will come in. I've got to say this. It's not real nice. I've got to say it. Doesn't that make you feel kind of bad that we see what Jesus has asked us to do and that we spend probably 75% of our time just trying to convince already Christians to be faithful? I'm just saying. Oh, I whine too. I'm not just pointing my finger at you. I I whine too. and I get caught up sometimes so busy in doing church I forget to be a Christian. I get so busy in being a professional preacher sometimes I forget that I'm called to go into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. Not just tell you to do it. We've got to go out from this place with a mission to reach lost people for Christ, to see people understand the gospel as we've presented it here today and often we present it in this place. Because uh, let me, I'll just give you an example. A pastor friend of mine, I don't know him real well, but we were in a pastor's group together at one point. This uh, past week I saw on Facebook, he's just started a church that's one and a half years old. And they're having a baptism today. And they're baptizing 13 people who've professed their faith in Jesus Christ. And you say, gosh, I wish we'd see that here. There's only two ways that we're going to see that here. Number one, we, I started to say you, see, see, I'm, I'm reinforcing that professional view of pastoring. We have either got to go into the highways and hedges and tell people about Jesus and encourage them in Christ and bring them in. And, and we just enjoy the fruit together. Or there have got to be 13 lost people in here to hear the gospel for the first time to be saved. And if we're not going out and, and presenting the gospel and the full presentation of the gospel and, and pleading with people to, to follow Jesus Christ and place their trust in him and live for him, and then bringing them in to celebrate with us, and if we're not bringing them in to church to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ either, if we're doing neither nor, what are we doing? Our responsibilities as Christians are not just to grow in our faith. It's not just to grow in our knowledge of the Bible. It's not just to have a powerful prayer life. It's not just to fellowship with other believers. It's not just to live a worship-filled life. Our responsibility is also to tell what we have experienced in Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely amazing that the more we tell others, the more others will want to experience what we've experienced in Jesus Christ too. Listen. 
here's the question. Have you experienced life change in Jesus Christ? Once again, in John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Have we experienced that Jesus? Have we experienced that forgiveness, that second chance? And is that good news to us? If it really is, I just believe we'll tell. If you've never experienced Jesus, but rather maybe only religion, I invite you to come meet Jesus today and follow him, trust him, profess him before everyone here and say, I want to know Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to obey him in believer's baptism. It's not Baptist baptism. It's believer's baptism. I want to put my life in his hands. That may need to start with some of you today, and it may need to start with some of you who've been here a while, and that's okay. We're here to celebrate with you. Others of you maybe who've never even thought of making that step before, this may be the day that God's saying to you, this is your day. This is your day. And then there's a third group I want to focus on today and close. Maybe you really do, when you think about it, you really do love God. You really are thankful to Jesus. You really do believe that we do need to tell others. But you've just gotten busy. Or, or you've just gotten maybe a little apathetic because you get caught up in life. And I want to say, first of all, that's understandable. So maybe today you want to be one of those that maybe stays where you are or comes here and, and prays at the altar or stands where you are or go pray with somebody else and just say, I've just, I've just gotten numb in my relationship to Christ. And I don't want to be numb. I don't want to be lukewarm anymore. I want to be on fire for Christ. Ask God to help you there. He hasn't moved. You have. Stand with me as we pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would lead us to the response that would bring you the honor and glory today that you deserve. Lord, I pray that... Um, God, as we ponder your word of what we've heard here today, and uh, if we look into our own hearts, Lord, that we would just be honest first with ourselves because we know that you know the truth about us and help us to respond in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord, for salvation, for recommitment, for forgiveness, whatever it may be. Help us to have the determination to not be ashamed of you, but to step out for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for joining our worship this week at Tiga K Baptist Church, located at 1875 Gold Hill Road. If you would like more... information about what it means to be a Christian or if you would like to know more about our church please feel free to contact us at 803-548-2600 or email us at tim at tigakbaptist.org again thank you for being with us today we hope you will join us again next week god bless you